Just a few short millennia ago, the whole of the British Isles was covered from end to end in a veil of green. These were the impenetrable medieval forests, punctuated only by towering crags, roaring rivers and misty, dark marshes. This lost landscape, possibly the greatest natural lost treasure of all, has all but disappeared today. But in one or two places, a few remnants survive. The once great royal hunting forests which have hung on down the centuries. In this episode, we're on the trail of these lost forests and the mysterious identity of a legendary hero who lived in a world which was often brutal and short. The infamous Robin Hood. In ages gone by, rivers formed the boundaries of northern hunting forests, and today our search for these lost forests starts at one of the greatest rivers in the northwest, the River Mersey. When you get down here to the banks of the River Mersey as the tide is pulling out, you get a sense of the might and power of this river. Might and power that would have been all too apparent to the Celts who lived here in the Bronze Age. During the Bronze Age, they sailed out onto the marshes opposite Frodsham and Helsby Hill, behind what is now Western Point Chemical Works, and dropped offerings into the river god or goddess of that time. We know this because in the late Victorian era, when they cut the Manchester Ship Canal through, those offerings were recovered. Bronze Age implements. 3,000 years ago, the River Mersey stretched its dark waters all the way across this plain that's here behind me. And it's in these dark, mysterious, misty waters that the Celts would sail out to drop offerings to the gods, to send them through the dark waters to the Celtic other world. And it's here that those offerings were found when they came to build the Manchester Ship Canal. Ancient people held a sacred awe for the great rivers like the Mersey, and it makes me wonder which other lost treasures might still be buried here. Throughout the centuries, the Mersey remained as an obstacle to be crossed, and I found evidence of the medieval method of crossing the river near the tiny village of Easton. This is the medieval Job's Ferry, a landing stage here on the Wirral, and during the medieval period, there were at least three major royal hunting forests here in the north of England. One at Macclesfield, one at Delamere, and one on the Wirral, bought by William de Stanley in 1280. And it's a survival from that period that we're here to see. Wirral Park Ranger Sarah Morton led me to a survivor of what might be part of the Forest of Wirral, which has been here on the banks of the Mersey for hundreds of years. How tall would you say it is? I think it's about, about 90 foot, something like that. Does this mean then that we're in really ancient woodland here? It is not ancient woodland, but it's certainly old woodland. This is 500, this is a veteran tree rather than an ancient tree. And your ancient trees that could be thousands of years old. Do you think we've got any ancient woodland left? We've got patches, I suppose, but there's, there's not really a lot. It's all kind of been built up since then. So this actually is a piece of living archeology span even so, at 500 years. Yes. Absolutely fantastic. So how come a tree survives for 500 years? Well, it was incorporated into the Victorian pleasure grounds that were here as a result of the number of people coming through on the Victorian ferry. And of course, those people needed to be collected in cabs. Five of them, in fact. The pleasure grounds were like a Victorian Alton Towers, including a grand hotel, boating lake, water chutes, and a ballroom that could hold 4,000 people. Visitors entered through a magnificent triumphal arch and experienced amazing contraptions, including a 40-foot high roller coaster that looped the loop and travelled at 95 miles an hour. Unsurprisingly, the roller coaster was deemed too dangerous and was dismantled, but the death-defying feats of world-famous tightrope walkers like Blondin captured imaginations for over 40 years. In the 20th century, crowds started to lose interest and the pleasure grounds vanished by the 1950s. A few miles away, I continued my search for the lost forests of the north and discovered more intriguing and forgotten history in the small medieval township of Frodsham on the edge of the royal hunting forests of Delamere. If you look carefully in old villages like Frodsham, you can spot wonderful things from ages past. The old timbers from this building were marked with Roman numbers when the trees were trimmed and then reassembled on the building plot as a sort of flat pack construction, much like when you buy modern self-assembly furniture today.
Not all listed buildings are buildings. Behind me is a K4 telephone kiosk, and it's one of only four surviving anywhere in the country, and I think it's absolutely fantastic. Nowadays, Frodsham Town sits between a forested hill and the sinking tidal marshes of the Mersey, and although relatively safe now, records suggest that in the past, freak weather conditions often threatened to destroy the town. A bit of detective work led me to the rear of the Old Hall Hotel, where I discovered the proof I was looking for, tide stones which mark where the Mersey flood tides had nearly swallowed up the village. Can you believe that the tide came all the way up to here in the 1800s? Look at this. Higher up the hill at Overton, quite safe from floodwaters, a lost thatched village of a bygone era once stood, until progress eventually swept it away. Churchyards are often one of the best places to find remarkable artefacts, and St Lawrence's Church here in Overton is no exception. At the end of the 1300s we start to get the name Freemason appearing in medieval documents and later on in the English Civil War some of those Freemasons were imprisoned on this site by Oliver Cromwell after the Battle of Worcester. How do we know this? Well this is one of those Civil War Masonic graves. The interesting bit is the spokeshave that you can see below the face. That represents Saint Catherine. Saint Catherine is one of the early Templar Saints of the Saint Clairs of Roslyn and quite obviously this is the grave of one of those people who died here during the Civil War. We're down here at the altar end of the church and on the outside wall at ground level you can see a window called Weimark's Window. Why is it called Weimark's Window? Well, between 1240 and 1280 there was an anchorite hermitess walled up in there for the purpose of prayer and seclusion. It's thought she may have died in there. Her bones could still be in there to this day. And when they came to clear the bones from the cemetery, all of those bones joined her body in there. So that has now become the charnel house. And it does make me wonder if there's any signs of that Anchorite Hermitess's cell inside the church. It's thought that Weimarkey's husband had passed away and that she'd inherited lands down near Leek in Staffordshire. And rather than remarry, which was the custom of the day, she decided instead to dedicate herself to the religious life. She joined the Order of Anchorites and it was then decided that this was the location she would come to and live out her days as a hermitess, a person living alone in the cell below the altar. Well here we are inside the church down at the high altar and there doesn't seem to be any sign at all of Weimark's medieval cell. There is however a corbel over there that's been converted into a Piscina basin with a really nice Templar cross on the front and then two spectacular windows that rise either side of the altar containing all the coats of arms for all the important places and families mentioned in this series so far. Spectacular. Another window depicts St Lawrence himself, a Christian martyr who was burned to death for his beliefs. St Lawrence is reputed to have told his torturers, turn me over, I'm cooked on that side. And for his troubles he holds the dubious honour of being the patron saint of rotisseries. Behind me is the monument to the Reverend William Charles Cotton, Vicar of St Lawrence's Overton, and it's said that he introduced beekeeping to New Zealand, hence the bee on the monument and the bee that you find all around Frodsham. But that's not his only claim to fame. While in office he gradually went mad and was seen singing in local pubs and at the Battle of Waterloo with a top hat on and a parrot on his shoulder. At the same time as this church was a dependency of Oxford and the same time as Lewis Carroll was writing his famous Alice in Wonderland. So is William Charles Cotton the real Mad Hatter? I'm standing next to one of four of the finest Norman period columns anywhere in Cheshire. They were constructed around the year 1185 by the foresters and the masons and the knights of Delamere. Not all the columns are absolutely identical though. One of them is octagonal 
And the reason for that, it is said, is that the Masons insisted that no building should be perfect except the one constructed by God himself. Therefore, they built the octagonal column in as a deliberate error. This is the North Chapel. It's said to be the chapel used and improved by the Freemasons. Indeed, the Freemasons brought this fantastic screen behind me here from Warrington Parish Church during the Victorian era. And it's said that an apprentice carved all the fretwork into the screens around here, which is not bad going for someone who's a newcomer to the craft. The beautiful treasures in St. Lawrence's Church are well worth exploring and a testament to the skills of the Freemasons and the medieval foresters. In part two, we investigate the medieval forests and the legend of possibly their most famous resident. In medieval times, Britain was carpeted by dense forests that covered the landscape. Delamere in Cheshire is one of these great hunting forests. If I'd have been standing here a thousand years ago, I'd be in the heart of the ancient British woodlands of Mondrum and Mara, which later became the Royal Hunting Forest of Delamere, which stretched all the way from the River Mersey behind me and out of the county in South Cheshire. Hidden in the Delamere Forest is a sacred well called Whistlebitch, and in Elizabethan times up to 2,000 people a day came for its healing properties and to give offerings. I went in search of the well, following a map that had been written in the 1600s, and it led me to a lower pool that was originally part of the larger well. It proved there was a flow of water under this valley, so I carried on up to see if the well had survived the passing of time. As you can see, this is what happens to a well when it's not used for several hundred years. It silts up. If it's been used for sacred offerings and things for thousands of years, then maybe below all this mud and this dirt, there's all sorts of items waiting to be discovered. I suppose in a way it's a shame that it's gone like this because I don't think 2,000 people a day would come and visit a site in this condition, but never mind, it's still got its spiritual atmosphere to this day. One ancient treasure that had survived since medieval times is a famous hunting horn called the Delamere Horn, which resides in the Grosvenor Museum. The horn was the symbol of office of the hereditary chief forester of Delamere, and at least according to later historians, the chief forester used it while in attendance upon first the Earls of Chester and then the Kings of England when they came to hunt in Delamere Forest. This magnificent horn is a wonderful lost treasure as it is one of only four surviving in Britain. The horn has been passed down from chief forester to chief forester and the most recent owner was actually the 36th chief forester of Delamere. The chief forester was known to live in a residence somewhere near Delamere Forest, so I set off in search of it. Well, we've searched the wilderness of Cheshire to try to find Upkinton Hall, which is the headquarters of the Delamere Foresters for almost 800 years. And sure enough, here it is. Deep in Cheshire's Delamere Forest, Upkinton Hall has stood for centuries as the ancestral base of the chief foresters, and many generations of nobility would have hunted from these buildings. Most of those buildings are still standing, but during the Second World War, this place was sadly neglected. And now, neither the current owner nor the current council have the funds to restore this, which means we have an amazing lost treasure here in the middle of Cheshire that's just disappearing before our very eyes. The medieval foresters imposed a tough regime on the peasants of Britain, and deep in the woods I met a man who could give me an insight into life under their rule. Are you permitted to enter the forest on a regular basis? Our Lord and Master, he allows us into the forest one day a year for free. That's when we bring the pigs in and they can snuffle around for all the beech nuts and all the acorns which are around here. Fattens them up for Christmas. Uh, the rest of the time, if anybody wants to bring any horses or cattle around here, they have to pay a fee. Whereabouts do you sit then in medieval society? I was what was called a villain at one time. Now a villain, they were actually uh, bound to their lord and master for life. In other words, we were not allowed to marry without our lord's permission. We were not allowed to leave the land, again, without his permission. And if anybody died in the family, such as my father did during the Black Death, then we actually had to pay a fine to our lord, because he was one worker down. 
Now in that old village where we used to live, almost half the people who lived in that village, they actually succumbed to the Black Death. So with being bound to our Lord and Master for life, he then had to actually pay us to work. And after about saving for about a year, I paid and became what was called a free man. And now I am a trader. I walk the length and breadth of the country selling my wares. The royal hunting forests were firmly protected by forest law, so the lords would be free to hunt their favourite quarry, the elusive wild boar. Wild boar vanished from our shores centuries ago, but have been reintroduced, and in the Forest of Dean in Gloucestershire, Dr Martin Goulding showed me signs that wild boar are alive and well and staging a comeback. By day, wild boar keep a low profile and are very difficult to find, but the damage they make to fields is apparent for all to see. Oh dear, look at that the size of that. That is absolutely unmistakable wild boar. And that's done with the snouts? That is done with their snouts. <laughs> Not very pleasing on the eye, but marvellous for the ecology of the area. Well, we've got the rich lords owning the royal hunting forests and the hunting rights in there, but what happens if you happen to be a peasant with your land directly adjacent? Is this the kind of problems you would have in medieval times? You would indeed, yes, and the peasants, as you can imagine, wouldn't be too chuffed, having spent all year tending their meagre crop of swedes or turnips and, and the boar had blitz it overnight, so that would make the boar very unpopular. How long, then, have we had wild boar here in Britain? We've always had wild boar. They are a native species, but we lost them. We lost them about 800 years ago through overhunting, but primarily habitat loss. Wild boar are a favoured animal to hunt, so it was a landed gentry, kings and queens, and they tried to reintroduce wild boar up until as recently as 300 years ago, using animals imported from France and Germany, uh, but the animals didn't survive. They weren't that popular with the locals because they were ravaging people's gardens, and uh, th th they all died out. But wild boar have remained a popular and exciting quarry, and they've recently been reintroduced to Britain because of their tasty meat. Back in medieval times, ordinary men were banished from the forest to allow nobility to hunt in them. One man, however, was prepared to stand up to that law, Robin Hood. I headed to the place where the final showdown between Robin Hood and the Sheriff of Nottingham is reputed to have taken place, Nottingham Castle. This model shows how the castle looked before it was destroyed around the time of the Civil War, and today only the gatehouse remains of the original medieval castle. But hidden beneath the 17th century mansion that stands on the castle's foundations are the original tunnels and dungeons that could have stood since the days of Robin Hood. Here we are in Nottingham Castle Dungeon, but the question is, was this the dungeon Robin Hood was kept in? And I've got somebody interesting meeting here to answer that question. Hello. Hello, nice to meet you, Lisa. Yes. Um, is it Robin Hood's dungeon? That's the golden question. It's actually locally known as David's dungeon. Right. Because the more famous prisoner was David II of Scotland. Ah. But there are a lot of stories about Robin rescuing people from dungeons or being thrown in dungeons, but this didn't actually become a dungeon until sometime in the 1300s. So if this wasn't a dungeon, what was it originally? It was what's known as an undercroft. So in the medieval period, it was basically a sort of storeroom, somewhere that they dug into or they built into the side of the castle, and it's where they would have kept food and provisions. So originally, it's more likely that Robin would have come here for his sandwiches rather than as a prisoner. <laughs> it would have been a dinner raid. <laughs> Glancing around this subterranean maze, it's exciting to think that Robin Hood could have made daring rescues through these tunnels. Or did he use these passageways to escape? The tunnels run all the way to the bottom of the hill, where an old pub may have played another part in the Robin Hood legend. So what's the connection between this pub and the legend of Robin Hood? It's called the Old Trip to Jerusalem because it's supposedly the last place that Richard the Lionheart stopped for a drink before his army went to Jerusalem, went on the Crusades. So if Robin ever actually did meet Richard, then this is possibly the last place that they would have seen each other? It's quite likely. Nottingham has many intriguing sites that feature in the tales of Robin Hood, but the most symbolic place has got to be Sherwood Forest itself. This once vast forest is now only a thousand acres in size, but it still holds one ancient survivor that would have witnessed the adventures of Robin Hood, the Major Oak. Legend has it that this is the tree that 
Robin Hood actually came around. But Robin Hood was close on 800, 900 years ago. Now this tree we possibly think is just somewhere just over a thousand years old. So this tree would only be a mere sapling when Robin Hood was around. So if he climbed up, if he climbed up this particular tree, it would have snapped. It would have snapped. And let's be honest, he could not have hidden in it. His tree there at the time, I believe, was to one side of this. I would like to think that this is an offspring, basically, of what was Robin Hood's tree. The stories of Robin Hood grew into legend and over the centuries generations of storytellers embellished tales of his adventures to the point where now we can't distinguish fact from fiction. But does it matter? There's still so much we can learn from the example of this great hero. Give ear and listen, good gentlefolk, that be of freeborn blood. And I'll tell you of good yeoman, his name was Robin Hood. Robin Hood still exists uh, where he's always existed, amongst these great ancient oaks of uh, Sherwood Forest, in our hearts and our minds as champion of the oppressed. And that's why he's popular throughout the whole world, isn't it? Because he's a symbol. He's a symbol of truth, justice and freedom. And these are things that we all hold dear, aren't they? And that is why he's famous throughout the whole world. So in real terms, how do we know whether Robin Hood actually existed? People think Robin Hood was a thing of the past. And it's just a figment of people's imaginations, but uh, he's still very real and relevant today because of uh, the fact this forest is endangered, and indeed this is as rare and as endangered as a tropical rainforest. Robin Hood is uh, rallying people in this day and age, and the tradition of storytelling is continuing. Ancient Sherwood Forest, birthplace of England's folklore son, is once again calling for people to stand as one. As Robin Hood rallied the Saxon folk against the Norman Iron Fist, so now we rally everyone to join us on our quest. Now, quest, my friends, to save Sherwood Forest for future generations.